Welcome to episode 9 of the Poker Face podcast. Escape from Shit Mountain. My mom, she put me in a Smurfette monarchy. Why would she do that? Good morning, Ian. How are things? Not too bad, Jen. It'd be better if you weren't wearing that monokini. Or is it a mankini? Everything is better when I wear my monokini. Everything. Why are you shuffling around in the seat like that? Everything apart from the comfort. Yeah, and the style. Yeah, well, I don't know. Some of us can pull it off. Did you enjoy this episode? I am not one. Uh, yeah, I think it was a great episode. So, and again, a departure from what we've seen, well, keeping some elements of the format, the the theming and the approach was very different. There's been an upward, a sharp upward trajectory, I think, in the last three I mean, We enjoyed the first lot as well. But no, yeah. They're all great, but I think it's really sort of taken off. The Elevated. Last, yeah. So next week's not a dud. No chance. Charlie, though, seems to have a remarkable resistance to death when we get into that. So much so that I thought that because of the dark nature of this show and how it often plays with expectations, it might do something drastic. It might kill off a, a character or two that you wouldn't expect. I think it's the type of show that could do that. I don't think they're going to kill off Charlie, though. They've described previously in interviews and stuff that the, the whole conceit of the show is that you want to spend time with Charlie. Yeah. Rather than solve the mysteries. But, but, just like Sledgehammer, season two, they could. And bearing in mind that this show does play with time yeah. on an episode by episode basis, they could set season two in the past. If that they wanted would, to. It was terrible when Sledgehammer did it. It would be terrible if these guys did it. <laughs> Nothing's terrible like Sledgehammer. Anyway, and appalling fudge. <laughs> before we uh, begin this week's discussion, a couple of omissions are one anyway. Okay. We mentioned the, the straight whiskey that Nick Nolte was drinking last week. It just says straight whiskey uh, on the on on the brand, which is obviously fake. Yeah? Yeah, well, that's it. At okay. the time I didn't mention it. Right. I quite liked it. Straight whiskey. Just literal, to the point. <laughs> yeah. That's what it says on the tin. And also, while I'm on Nick Nolte and Arthur, I thought at one point that Nick Nolte had a skill maybe similar. It was, uh, there was one particular scene where I thought he can also detect... Uh, BS like Charlie. Anyway, that got me thinking how it might be good to see in a future episode Charlie either work with or come up against an adversary who has the same uh, power, the same ability. That could make it an interesting head to head. It would also be interesting to see her come up against somebody who is so deluded that they believe they're telling the truth even when they're lying. Yes, but that would, she wouldn't detect that then. I think she wouldn't take that, yeah. but there may be other things that you could, mm-hmm. you could pick up around, or it might lead her in the wrong path. But then you could work it back. Yeah, I'm sure the folk have paid a lot of money to work out these things can can find a way to make it. Work. Yeah, well, we've done it, done it for free. Exactly. Have that one on us. App two, yeah. <laughs> uh, social media. Anyone wants to catch up with us, please do talk to us about this episode, about any of the previous episodes. You can get us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Threads at Columbo Podcast. You can find show notes on the website columbopodcast.com where there's an opportunity to leave your comments, thoughts, reminiscences and you can get hold of the podcast on all your usual podcast providers or on YouTube at Columbo Podcast Productions. Indeed. Before we begin, I have you watched the David Beckham documentary not on yet. Netflix? I didn't really fancy it but uh, the wife said, do you want to watch this? And I said, uh, not really. She went, I'll go on. I had to watch it because... I have persuaded her to watch uh, Poker Face with me, so I'm, I'm started. I've started again. We're at. Uh, we've watched the first three episodes. Okay. So it's not really her type of thing, but, but you're forcing her to watch. No, it anyway. no, I'm not. I, I I forced her to watch the first one, and I told her it was a strong female lead, etc. She might enjoy it, and I think she has been enjoying it grudgingly, I suppose. <laughs> she doesn't want to say I quite like this. It's not her thing. She, for example, she's never watched an episode of Columbo. She thinks it's a uh, type of crap that she would uh, remind her of being a kid in her granny's place. Yeah, uh, a lot of things you watch her oh grand, yeah. grandfather did. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no, so she's been enjoying that. Anyway, my point being is that I felt a bit like, okay, you've watched this for me. I watched this David Beckham thing. Um, Any revelations? I mean, I, it, in fairness, I quite enjoyed the first episode. Not not sort of revelation, but from a football point of view, it was you know it was quite nostalgic watching uh, the you know, that sort of history. But uh, no, what I did find, I I had to pause it and go wait a second. First couple of scenes, credits are on the screen. Yep. Directed by 
Fisher Stevens. Oh, Columbo Connection. A Columbo Connection, of course, Murder, Smoke and Shadows. He played the director in that to be mentioned actually last Maybe week. Maybe this is what he was making in Murder, Smoke and Shadows. Could have been. Obviously, Short Circuit and Hackers, etc. Et um, but yeah, that was an unusual um, name to see in a David Beckham documentary. What name would you have expected to see directing it? Ken um, Loach. Ken Loach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there we go. Anyway, it's worth a watch. It's all right. Sure. Before we get into the bits and pieces of this episode, shall we do a summary? Let's crack on. In Escape from Ship Mountain, we meet Trey Mendez and Jimmy Silva, two friends with a shared secret from the past. When Trey's ankle monitoring system fails in a snowstorm, he's able to escape house arrest, but with terrible consequences. After an idyllic summer in the Rockies, we find Charlie desperate to return to sea level. She gets in tow with a kleptomaniac drifter called Morty, before the pair find themselves wrapped up in Trey and Jimmy's world. A night at Jimmy's motel comes with fatal consequences. But will Charlie be the last one standing? Or has she taken on one killer too many this time? Mm, thank you, Ian. Now, this is... Um, we've mentioned before, but we have to praise the photography and poker face. Beautiful shots. And also, I, I'm not sure, I mean, I'm not a technical person at all, but the, when I said that I was watching the stall recently, there are, there's a, a colour aesthetic, aesthetic to it. I don't know if it's a colour grading or whatever it is, but it's shot in a, a certain way. You can you can tell by just looking at it that it's from Poker Face. It's got, it's got a identifiable, I don't identity, know. Yeah. Identity, yeah. yeah. You can't say identifiable identity. That would be that too would, much. Of course it would be. A clear identity. <laughs> Only a fool would say such a Unrecognisable. <laughs> yes, no. Yeah, absolutely. We hear the wind blowing. I like that sound as well as we come across the um, snowy peaks, which I presume are the Rockies. Yeah, I mean, the, the sound was great there because I think what it did was it... It gave that sense of sort of isolation, although it's not quite as isolated as what you might think from the opening shots. Sure. Because we um, quickly come upon a very modern and expensive looking house at the foot of the mountains, which contains a sullen looking man who is uh, Trey. Yes, a, a bearded man inside the compound, I've called him. Okay. We see got a compound? I'm not sure it's a compound. It's, his well, house. it's got big gates outside. It's, it's because, a large area. Yeah, okay. I'm, yeah. well, I'm not sure if sort of millionaires live in compounds as much. Well, You're know. thinking of David Koresh. <laughs> Anyhow, we see him over and over again following the same routine. He exercises, he makes his healthy shake. It's a Groundhog Day montage. Yes. And the, we see him also showing his character. Okay, yeah, we do. So before we get to that, he is um, is clearly not very happy. He's gone through this routine, but we see day by day he's getting more annoyed, more frustrated uh, by repeating these activities i think he, i think he slams at one point he's he's golf club down and uh, he he's, he's drinking, drinking the sink and, yeah. yeah he never tips for the food delivery no and it's not just a case of it not being easy to tip it's a case of him actively choosing not to tip indeed he seems to enjoy doing it yeah and or not doing it's, it. it's particularly bad because it's always the same delivery driver yeah the days progress and he becomes, as I said, you know, more frustrated to an almost Jack Torrance degree. You know who Jack Torrance is, don't you? Now, we're going to mention this movie a few times in the book. Well, I'm assuming you're going to see The Shining. Yes. Because that's what Jack Torrance is from. Have you seen The Shining? No. No, oh, okay. Fair enough, fair enough. Hardly anyone's seen that. No, oh, it's an yeah. underground hit, you might say. Yeah, cult classic. <laughs> yeah, so we come to him collecting his food and it's now dark, so we assume it's either... Later in the year, or I, I think that must be it. It is later in the year. It's the same time yeah. of day as before, but it's later in the year, so it's now dark. Yeah, it's a, again, a shorthand way of showing this uh, the, the, the season passing. Yeah. And the delivery driver has finally had enough, and instead of handing him his his food as he normally does... Well, he used to hang it on the gate. Yeah. And now he, yeah, he's left it about 10 feet outside the gate. So, so does this driver know that he can't come out? Yeah. You think? I think he must. Okay. Anyway, yeah, he leaves it just out of reach of him and gives him the finger as he, as he yeah. uh, walks away. So Trey then has to kind of contort himself and we see that he's wearing an ankle monitoring an electronic thing. tag, yeah. yeah. So back inside his mood worsens as the bag of food bursts on the floor and the weather report on TV talks of the pending snowstorm that's going to hit the area. We see him grab a bottle of rum, I think off-brand Malibu probably. 
I, I looked, I paused this a few times. I couldn't get the brand. It I just says think. coconut rum, I think. No, there was something like a Golata or, or oh, right, okay. I couldn't find any any rum. Rum was my final ever drink. That was the, the final thing that did it for me before I thought, you know what, I need to wrap this. <laughs> so I've got a soft spot. Not white rum. Yeah, Diplomatica Reserva Exclusive, I think it was. Before the incident that we before, won't talk about. We never talk about that. <laughs> uh, similar to this guy, actually. Uh, so he pulls this rum out from under his table full of whiskeys that he's been drinking mm -hmm. in all the previous runs through. Which we assume this means something. Well, I think it means... Some people don't agree with certain drinks. So if you drink this, you, you lose it a bit. Maybe you become an angrier person or just goes, you know, just affects you in a, 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 in a worse way than other drinks. Uh, certainly he's got it in his house anyway. So there must be some reasoning behind it. I think he, he does actually say later on that this drink ca carries memories for him. Mm. It's associated with a certain time in his life. Sure. And at this point also, we see that he notices his tag doesn't seem to be working. The light's gone out and his phone then rings. It's the local cop who tells him that the monitoring system is down due to the weather, but reminds him of his parole responsibilities and also tells him that he's going to be checking in at seven o'clock the next morning and not to do anything effing stupid. Why would they give him that information? Yeah, you would say... It's intermittent. And, and also, I'll try and pop... I'll, I'll pop over as soon as I can. You don't have to you yeah. know, but keep him keep him on his toes. Yeah. Anyhow, this is like a carte blanche. You see in his eyes. <laughs> yeah, of course. He understands the, yeah. what this means. The next thing we see is Trey speeding in his, uh, his, his very expensive Lamborghini on the snowy roads as if he's playing one of his computer games. And he's Still drinking. He's literally drink driving. <laughs> yeah. He narrowly avoids some kind of moose or stag. It's a stag, yeah. Uh, before hitting a person. And so the idiot stops, he gets out in his driving shoes. Did you notice those? Have you ever had a pair of driving shoes? No, I've not. They look like slippers, but they've got the, the heel goes up, uh, the grip goes up on the heel, so that if you're using a pedal, it's still... Right. Yeah. Driving shoes, driving Is slippers. Is that a wealth thing? Is that why they're showing him to be a wealthy guy? Mm, maybe, no, I mean, I think it's the type of... I don't know. Maybe a car people thing. Maybe a car people thing, yeah. yeah or just, yeah. Anyway, yes, as you see, he gets out his car and nudges the person with his foot but there's no response and then he panics as he sees the uh, the lights of a car coming towards him in the distance and so he rushes to drag the body and put it in his uh, trunk his boot just in time yes uh, this truck passes him mm. by and i wanted to mention here you see the snow falling and I'm, i think these days that's probably cgi snow so i don't think any of this snow would be yeah, they wouldn't wait for a snowy day to or film because it, it wouldn't behave no but in the olden days you'd have used a snow machine yeah I suppose. Yeah, but I think this is all CGI now. Potentially. After this truck goes by, he drives off again, making a phone call as he goes to someone he calls Brother. Yeah, it's his friend Jimmy, who runs the, the Bates, sorry, the, the Deerfield Motel. This looked brilliant outside. I just loved that, that this type of uh, setting. You can always hear the flicker of the neon lights. Yeah, and, and it's just perfectly uh, conducive to a, a murder mystery. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the locked, or the, the, you know, the isolated area where you can't get in and out absolutely we see him putting his phone down slowly before trey pulls up outside apologizing yeah well um, i think the way he puts his phone down um and then i think he turns on the no vacancy sign as well we see that okay so this shows that he's not delighted to have this call and to know that trey's coming along no no trey gets out his car tells this guy jimmy that it's good to see him but jimmy responds with a sullen what do you think is going to happen here, Trey? Yeah, I mean, Trey's obviously very, very insincere. He tries to pretend everything's fine. Yeah, he's acting like he's picking up an existing relationship. But I think they mentioned it's been years since they, they last met or spoke. Yeah. Trey tells him that he needs to use, in quotes, the spot. Yeah. Now, here's the thing. The spot is referred to several times in this episode and in my notes I always just refer to it as the, the spot and I'm wondering if that was ever considered as the title of this week's episode I'm sure it could have been maybe but I think that one of the reasons why they might not have it might have been too similar to the stall maybe maybe anyway or it could be they came up with the title before they finished yeah the story that as well we saw that line was it Quantum Leap we used to criticise because we felt the episodes were built on a nice pun in the title <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so that's not enough to build an episode of yeah. not the case here we find ourselves at the spot what yeah. is it it's a hole under a tree yeah it's a, a cavern in, in the roots which um, they carry uh, this body that Trey has knocked down yep uh, they've wrapped in blankets now yep and dump it unceremoniously uh, in, inside it and they cover over the hole and Trey 
you know, almost in a friendly way, he touches yeah. Jimmy on the shoulder, but he's not interested. No, he's trying to create this sort of bond. We're both in this together and well done, my pal, you know. But yeah, Jimmy, throughout this entire episode, he's never um, enthused about w what's going on. No. Back at the, the motel reception, you might call it, uh, Trey says he's going to leave. He accepts that he's a P POS. Bag, yeah. And that Jimmy's a true friend, says he'll talk it out. However, Jimmy's reaction kind of holds him back from leaving. Yeah. Jimmy's on the verge of a breakdown, I think, or a, an explosion. So he decides that they can have the, this chat right now. Well, Jimmy's demeanour right through the first 45 minutes of this episode is hard to read. It's like you're not entirely sure what's going on in his head, I don't think. No, no. And it's good, it's very well acted. Inside, Trey finds an old stash of your rum behind the reception desk and pours in both a drink. But Jimmy doesn't know how he can... Uh, drink that shit I think he says he says it brings him back to better times oh, yeah which he toasts alone before offering an apology and trying to explain what has been happening in his life I owe you a lot brother I know that and I am sorry that I didn't call you as soon as I got back into town it's just been f***ed up here can I show you something look at this shit Some asshole at my firm couldn't make his nut. He goes to a whistleblower, accuses everyone of insider trading. Some bullshit. They make me take the fall. Now I'm six months into a 14-month sentence. I'm losing my fucking mind. Six months. You've been back for six months, and this is out here for me. I was on house arrest. Yeah, you on phone arrest too? Bro, I was embarrassed. Okay, the whole town knows me as this big shot, and then I come back with a tag on my ankle, like some cow? Yeah, sure, it's humiliating for you being back here, huh? I didn't say that. It's just, you're like family to me, and I, I didn't want you to know. Anyway, looks like you're doing great, huh? Pops left you the place. Yeah, it's been a real picnic. You got your family's money, you go to Stanford, and I get stuck in this fucking dump, you know? Fuck. You don't know what this place was like after all of it. You were gone. Everywhere I looked, I saw her face. It's the power. It does this during storms. So that clip ends with them in darkness because the lights have all gone. And at this point, Jimmy sees Trey checking his watch and angrily tells him that he should just go. But Trey responds to what has not been said and states that there is nothing he can, he can say about what happened in the past that would help. Yeah, so he suggests they don't talk about it, but this isn't impressing Jimmy at all. Not just that, but he's got an easy solution of giving him money, which only further angers him. And he accuses him of always being like that since they were kids. So, you know, I obviously get the feeling that Trey has been a, you know, had privilege yeah. his entire life. Trey takes offence to Jimmy's suggestion that he went to Stanford. <laughs> no, he points out it was Harvard. <laughs> and he is about to leave at this point and perhaps he'll regret not having left earlier, shortly. Why is that? There's a knock on the door. And they realise... Well, it's, it's more than a knock, it's a series of bangs on the door. Quite sinister and creepy, I imagine. But the roads are closed and there's uh -huh. no way for anyone to get there. So Jimmy grabs a handgun and Trey reminds him that, again, as you say, the, the roads are, are closed. So with tension and trepidation, they open the door and see... It looks like the corpse has made its way from the tree to the door, but it's still dead. <laughs> yeah. Beside it is a, what looks like a, a stick, a log... Yeah. that they've been they've been holding they stare at it for a moment not sure what to do well I think Jimmy's about to shoot it yeah but are startled when it gasps for breath just like in Seven have, have, you've seen Seven yeah good once okay just then a car pulls up as well so Trey improvises yes he takes a gun from Jimmy and crouches down and shouts to the driver that she needs help in any case, we are blinded by the lights and so we don't know uh, who she is or who the driver is. So it could be uh, it could be Charlie, it could be someone else. Well, we assume that Charlie's in the car because she always knows the person that gets hurt or just connected with them. 
Mm. And who else would be showing up? So we jump back to the start of Charlie's story at this point, and there's no snow in the mountains here. No, it's months earlier. And she makes an, a familiar appearance driving her car along with her, uh, her theme in a more pleasant summer setting. She stops and complains about how many trees there are as she tries to figure out where she is on a map. She's not in her element. Uh, she doesn't like nature, does she? No. Well, she said before she doesn't like the beach. She That's does. true. Yeah, she likes the sort of cities and towns, I think. I think she's that sort of girl. However, her attitude does a 180 when she meets a hunky outdoors type. Yeah, she says she wants to get off the, the never-ending mountains from hell, but he asks her why. Yeah. She initially tries to resist and uh, refuses this offer of help or she explains she has a no second location policy yes which has served her well in not getting zodiac so far she also mentions having been a bit of a death magnet lately which is uh, a nice sort of self-awareness and maybe even sort of meta in terms of the, yeah. the show but her defenses are obliterated at this point yes he takes off his shirt to reveal his over optimized musculature yeah it's certainly a an adonis like uh, torso he looks like he uh, has been dehydrating for no apparent reason. <laughs> yes. But uh, she, I quite like this as well. She says, oh, well, we've got to, we've all got to go sometime. <laughs> yeah. So she puts her map away and he leads her to a lake and calls the place his magic mountain. You know, as they walk, Charlie tells him that the smell of pine trees reminds her of uh, shitty Christmases. And at this point, I thought, do you know uh, what? We've not really had any backstory. Nope. Um, about Charlie and I think that maybe it would be useful and certainly uh, season two would be a, a good place to, to give us or maybe next week really okay well, um, we can get back to this because how this episode ends yep. you have to question her um, her support network yeah well we'll get to that okay yeah about this lake you mentioned we then get some happy music and a montage as the two of them spend their summer together yeah it's a it, it's quite um, a juxtaposition you know, from from what we understand, Charlie, her attitude and yeah. what she's been through. Oh, she's quite clearly smitten with this guy. Yeah, it's, it's obviously, uh, you know, a, a, a bit of a sort of joke here, a bit of a pastiche of a different type of show where they're, sort of, uh, they're singing and hugging and dancing and um, she's loving life and everyone's wonderful. Although the only thing that did, it just shows you a sign of the times. There's, you see one scene, her smoking, and the next scene, there's a big kiss. And, but, uh, yeah, I mean, back in the day, I mean, we've all been there plenty of times, I would assume, uh, kissed a, a smoker, you know, you'd, you know, maybe get lucky at a nightclub. Uh, and, you know, it was just sort of normal you would do that. But these days, a mouthful of... Well, back then, the whole place smelled of smoke anyway. Yeah, that's true. But as you said, the difference is you go, geez, smoking, uh, kissing a smoker must be a, a bit manky. The, the old uh, licking the ashtray. Yeah. But yeah, so that this was um, it, it was a, a fun. Yes. Little it concludes with uh, Charlie and this guy whose name is Luke, but I don't know. If we actually hear that during I the just episode. Call him the hunk. Um, they're sitting next to a fire, and she announces to the ether that she's never leaving Magic Mountain. <laughs> we get a brilliant cut. Um, Fantastic. Uh, and on the screen, it tells us, "Boom! It's February, and there's snow falling. Um, the hunk is nowhere to be seen." I've got a question about that. We can get to that in a second. And Charlie is to be found getting soaked and trying to make a few bucks, annoying drivers by cleaning their windscreens outside Teta's gas station. Yep. What do you think happened here? Did Charlie get bored of him or did he get bored of her and leave? What's happened with this I relationship? I think he just, he just left because it was the end of the I think they both left. It's the end of the season. They're going their separate ways, but she's not getting any petrol now. See, my... Understand, or my reading off it would be that he was a local. I don't think so. And he's staying here, but she is now fed up with him. You know, there's only so much muscle that you can enjoy. <laughs> uh, maybe he's not the most intellectual of people. I, mean, I think ultimately it doesn't really matter who's leaving who. Or, but I, I think it's implied that he's gone right. and left her there. And she's like, I'm now stuck in this mountain. It's no longer magic. Okay, sure. I need to get off. Stan, the manager of the gas station, is I like not, Stan. Yeah, not happy with her. Uh, doing this but she promises she just needs a lot more cash and she'll have enough to fill her tank and get the CUDA to Denver and she knows that he wants her to go to Denver <laughs> so yeah. he says she's got 40 minutes before he 20 minutes was it 20? I think so yeah okay well he's, she's got a short period of time to get this done before he's going to call the police and at this point she takes a flyer and crashes down onto her back <laughs> yes a girl comes out saying that she effing wiped <laughs> yes well, a woman you might say I say a woman yeah uh, she helps her up and offers her a long list of medicinal and recreational drugs that she can get if she wants to. She immediately reminded me of uh, Marge from um, 
Yes, episode two of the night shift. Yes, who had a she was dealing in uh, pharmaceuticals. Maybe she's a time traveler. It's young Marge. Could be, and also given how it ends. No, uh, later on, she, I think she talks about. Um, no, we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah. Anyhow, Charlie doesn't want any of that stuff. She just wants to get off the mountain. This is where she titles it, as we heard in the, as we know from the episode title. Yeah. So the woman offers to fill her up in return for a ride, which Charlie thinks is a great deal, uh, providing. She gets her wallet back. The little thief returns it. Yes. That's a, a recurring uh, action in this. It is. She is uh, shocked that she's been discovered, but quite brazen, and laughs as she throws it back and the two enter the building. Inside, Charlie tells Stan that she hears a customer and needs a fill up. And notes the missing poster for a Chloe Jones, which has a $75,000 reward. Oh, we never mentioned it. When Charlie first appears and uh, stops her car and gets out before she meets the yep. hunk the trail is called the Chloe Jones Trail okay a bit like uh, Clayton Ravine from Back to the Future 3 the the teacher One Pine Mall yeah well no but yeah anyway yeah we see the woman taking a card from a wallet that's clearly not her own and making this payment and Stan recognises the situation right away so the, the name of the card is a Mr. Uh, Mortimer Bernstein. She knowingly <laughs> insists it's a family name. And he doesn't care uh, as long as they both uh, agree to get out of their pronto. Yeah, he'll take this payment and he'll get his money mm -hmm. and they can leave and it's not his problem. No. And Monty will just uh, claim it back in his card. Morty. Morty, sorry, yeah. We'll claim it back in his, his card and everyone's happy apart from the insurance company. Sorry, the... Victimless crime. Yes, pretty much. Now on the road. Yes, Charlie and uh, Mortimer are driving down the mountain. There's an even greater vibe of The Shining here, just the way the road winds and, and the snow. Is there? Yeah. Okay, I'll take your word for it. Mm -hmm. Charlie asks why uh, Mortimer was up there in the first place, and she says she was bored and followed the snow, but needs to get off the mountain now. Yeah, and Morty talks about her, uh, her nomadic existence, which Charlie asks if she can... Uh, teach her about well no so what happens is she says she's similarly nomadic but without the kleptomania and asks if she can be taught the kleptomania side. <laughs> however her non-judgmental companion insists that she's not into sex stuff <laughs> <laughs> I like the idea that she maybe just doesn't know the word kleptomania yeah, that's what it is yeah <laughs> but she does hold another um, view which I said is similar to Marge when she claims that snow chains are a myth invented by Big Otto <laughs> yes so they don't um, stop to put the chains on. Instead, she advises Charlie just to turn into the deer. Yes. <laughs> and Charlie is forced to swerve into a, a snow embankment. Into a drift, yeah, by the side of the road because there is a deer, indeed, on the road. And it just wanders off as they realise that the car is beached. And they have to make, therefore, a decision about who is going to go for help. I don't think they did have to make that decision. If that was me... I would stick together. Yeah, it makes sense. Charlie's concerns, I think, are exaggerated here. She thinks that Morty wants her to go back so she can steal the car. Mm. If they can't get the car out of the snowbank, the two of them, how's Morty going to get the car out of well, the snowbank herself? I'll tell you, possibly another car or truck passes and Just helps. pull someone down, mm. yeah. Well, that could be her plan. Anyway, Charlie's on to her because she can tell she's lying, so Morty instead heads off to get this tow yeah, truck. but only after the klepto freak returns her wallet for a second time. Indeed. It's now later. Yeah, it's night time, I think, now. It's, it's dark, the car's covered in snow, and Charlie must be wondering why she chose to stay behind on her own. She puts on her coat and gets out the car. And immediately sees the stag, and they both sort of stare at each other. Why did she get out of the car? Is she going to try and hail someone down? Or? Oh, I think she's maybe going to walk back herself. Okay. This uh, staring at the stag reminded me of Cameron from Ferris Bueller's Day Off in the museum. I've seen that movie. Uh, yeah. yeah, so you know that scene where yeah. I think it's the Smiths that's playing actually the tune. It's a very haunting and... Talking yeah. of the, the sound, there's a nice eerie tune playing in this. Yes. Moment. Yeah. Um, but this stag walks on and Charlie sets off down the road and sees headlights from an approaching high-speed vehicle. And so she raises her arms for help, but I think at the last second she realises it's not going to stop. No. She looks away, I think, and it kind of clips her. More than a clip, yeah, it's quite a... I think well, it sends her up in the air. It hits her with the wing mirror, we find. Is it just the wing mirror? And maybe just a little bit of the side of the car, because okay. that's where the damage is on the car. Yeah, um, it could have quite easily been fatal 
Well, maybe it should have been fatal. Yeah, obviously it was Trey. And we find her waking up with a terrified gasp in the spot. Yes, in a hole in the ground with a hobbit or <laughs> something. She's kind of panicked, she's obviously. Dis- clearly. She's, she's disorientated, alive. doesn't know where she is yet. But she manages to break out like someone from the living dead. Well, she sees these shafts of light coming through the tree roots. Uh, so fortunately it wasn't night or too late at night for her to... No, maybe it was moonlight, who knows. It was dark when she got put in there, wasn't it? Yes. So anyway, she fi- finds her way out and she sees the motel lights come on. Presumably this is after the power cut that we saw earlier on. Mm-hmm. She's covered in dirt. It's, it's, it's a nice look, or a nice... Disgusting look. In the context, yeah. Uh, she's in pain, she's moaning, but she manages to drag herself to this motel with her stick and thump on the door as we heard before passing out. Yeah, the distance from the door doesn't make sense to me. No? She doesn't seem to be within arm's length of it's the door. It's not arm's length, it's arm and stick length. So, but the amount of knocking she was making, you'd think she'd be a bit closer, I thought. Mm. But anyway, it doesn't matter too much. It's okay. Not are you, big are deal. you Indiana Jonesing this one? I'm not going to. Well, VAR. Let's yeah. have a quick look at the lines. How far is it? Anyway. She wakes again, uh, moments, she kind of passes out and then wakes again to see Morty arriving in her car and asks, are you me? Yes, before passing out once more. We are now in the uh, motel. She comes around again with Trey and Jimmy beside her trying to figure out what she knows. Hey, try to stay awake. Did I just die on Shit Mountain? You're at a motel. We found you by the door. Do you know what happened? I'm dead. I died on Shit Mountain. I've always been the caretaker. What? Uh, no, you're not dead. Do you know what happened? Uh, uh, hello. Little Twiggy friend. Where did you come from? Hey. Can you focus? Can you focus on me right now? Uh, Mr. Serious Focus, ma'am. That's me. Yes, listen, you've been very badly hurt, but you're safe. We're trying to figure out what happened. What do you remember? Yeah, uh, you see, uh, okay. Uh, There was moose. Moose? Moose. Communicating. And I thought... Is he warning me? Some kind of a moose warning. That's crazy, though. But he was. So you think you were attacked by a moose? No, no, no. That's a stag. Hey, what's your name? Charlie. Uh, so sorry. Um, where am I? You're at a motel. We found you outside. Yeah. Uh-huh. Ah! Ha! Oh, f**k. My leg. Jesus. Oh, my God. My everything. At this point, she does start to remember what happened to her. Mm-hmm. You obviously got the Shining reference in. Yeah, with the caretaker. Yeah. yeah, good. So, like I say, Charlie, at this point, begins to recall what happened. She remembers the headlights coming towards her, everything hurting, and then remembering being a kid again back at the Anaheim Shores Beach Club. And she starts to freak out about thinking, could that be the happiest moment of my life? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, it's interesting. We do have a little bit of sort of a slight hint at a, a backstory here. We'll find out later why she thinks of that. Also, but in this, there's a, a, a touch of uh, the Wizard of Oz. She says, oh, you, you were there. And Trey thinks, because she's pointing towards Trey, yeah. but it's the uh, stag, stag behind him. Yeah, on the wall. Yeah. Of course, this is where the, the intro clip comes from, with the monokini. Indeed. She now asks the guys who they are and they tell her their names and we see Morty come out of another room saying she's charged her phone up to 7% but there's no phone signal there's no Wi-Fi or any other connection here she sorts out the the, 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 the writer's problem you have in these situations it's that, the old Star Trek communicators don't work yep. problem yep Charlie is not happy with her but the guys uh, step into a, a cloakroom to discuss what they should do and leave the girls to it so in this cloakroom Jimmy is pleased that Charlie is alive, but the callous Trey claims that the only good thing is that for the moment she's suffering from CRS. Can't remember Shit. something. Okay. And hopes that she's got permanent brain damage. Oh, that's a bit harsh. Yeah, well, he was trying to kill her. Especially as she has just mentioned remembering stuff. Mm. He's maybe overconfident about this. No. 
Jimmy's not so happy, but accepts that he doesn't want her to be asking questions and then points out that the roads are all closed. They'll give them a room for the, the night and uh, we'll keep them there until the morning until they can work out something more substantial. However, Trey has to leave. <laughs> Jimmy doesn't care about his parole and reminds him of the consequences of cops coming to the motel and poking around and what would happen if they found the spot. Trey says that they can't, that's why it's the spot, and tells him to shut the F up. And they themselves discuss uh, calling the cops until Jimmy points out that the lines are down and so, with a smile, they walk back through to the... We also see Trey move the gun from his hoodie pocket to his back pocket at this yes. point. So they take advantage of the lines being down by making a show of calling the police until Charlie signals to him that they don't want the cops involved. So everyone's happy at this point. No one... Charlie's obviously on the run, Morty's a little thief, and um, the two guys are not keen on the, the cops being there either. No. Morty, though, upsets Charlie by saying that she saw some cops closing the road to Denver, and Charlie realises that this wasn't her first stop after <laughs> retrieving the vehicle. Yes. At this point, she's got an accusation to make. What's that? She asks um, Mortimer straight up whether she or any of her associates ran Charlie down so that she could get away with the car. And she's satisfied that the answer is in the negative. However, she does have to ask for her wallet back once more. A third time, yeah. Trey at this point notes that the nearest clinic is in Avon. Hmm? It's not accessible and they should rest for the night and sort things out in the morning. And he agrees with Morty that there should be no charge for this room. Indeed. Jimmy asks if Charlie can walk and even though she says she can, she screams B. Arthur's name in vain before collapsing back down. Indeed. You know who B. Arthur is? What? Golden Girl. Of course. Yeah. There's Don't a Colombo at... reference there. In Ashes, there's a Golden Girl on that, isn't there? Yes. The other one. Yeah, Rue McLachlan. Yeah. Who played Blanche Devereaux. You're the Golden Girls expert. I do have uh, the first two seasons on, uh, <laughs> I purchased. I used to watch it if I had uh, sleep over at my grandparents. Yeah. That's the only time I remember seeing it. <laughs> Anyhow, Morty thinks she can make a splint for Charlie's leg using an old walking stick, but Jimmy stops her saying it's an antique... Yeah, Charlie has a, a better idea, she thinks. They can use, uh, or she can use her stabby stick. That's the one that she was knocking on the door with. Yes, Morty picks it up, um, but screams when she realises that it's not, in fact, a stick. And just then the lights go off, which only heightens the... The moment, yeah. yeah. The boys suggest it's an animal bone, maybe a fossil, but the um, sad truth is it's a person bone. <laughs> yes. And it has pins in it, so it's not even that old. No, because I think uh, Trey is, he's quite desperate. Uh, for it not to be uh, a recent uh, deceased uh, human yeah. being. He said, oh, you found a fossil. But no, there are surgical pins in it. Yeah, and this leads Morty to mention her gnarly friend Turbo, who showed her x-rays of his post-accident leg, which was very similar. Yes, which brings Charlie's mind around to the missing snowboarder. Yes, and asks if the Mattel has one of these missing posters. And when Jimmy says no, she calls BS and wonder why he would lie about that. But Morty knows why. Or she thinks she knows why. He wants the reward for himself. Uh -huh. So Jimmy then admits that he has a poster and hands it over to the delighted uh, Morty, who is thinking of the money. And Charlie notes that it looks like they have found Chloe Jones. Trey looks concerned, but tells him they still can't do anything before the morning. And asks Jimmy to go and get the rooms ready. And as he leaves, Charlie notices... Yeah, his, his tag on the ankle. Uh -huh. The guys have barely gone and Morty is again trying to pilfer, this time from the cash register and isn't immediately interested in listening to Charlie's concerns. Well, you're a woman of the world. I mean, I can't be the only one getting bad mojo around here, right? Now these guys want to put us in a room. Well, that is a second location, my friend. So? Well, I've got a very strict never let dudes take you to a second location policy. Serve me quite well. I don't know. I'm pretty sure the whole motel counts as one location. Besides, the angry one in the sweatsuit's kind of hot. Okay, well, he's he's wearing an ankle monitor, so that's kind of a major red flag. Oh, yeah? Ooh. Morty. I'm just saying, those things are mostly for rich guys that have lawyers and do, like, light crimes. Light crimes. Oh, very good. Okay, you guys make a terrific couple. I'll see you at the wedding, guys. <sighs> hot or not, there's no way we're sharing that reward money with those Brodinskis. We wouldn't even know it was a bone if it weren't for me. Uh, yes, your contributions have been manifold. And you are the one who found it because you were left for dead. That's not nothing. Oh, you're right. 
It's not nothing. In fact, it's odd, huh? What? Well, what are the chances of me almost dying and then getting dumped right next to another body? Statistically? And no, wait. I wasn't dumped. That weird tree thing that I woke up in, it's hard to find. You'd have to know it was there. So that means whoever hit me in the road and stuck me there, they also maybe buried Chloe Jones. Yeah, I figured that out 10 minutes ago. But the thing with a hit and run is they probably ran. I ran where? The roads are closed. There is nowhere to run. Give me the phone. Only if you promise. We split the reward. Yeah, you, you, you win. Give me the phone. Look, I'm calling this in under your name, you know, assuming that you have one. Holy shit. This line is dead. I don't think these guys call the cops. Why would they do that? Well, uh, I, I don't know, but I'm not really in a speculating mood right now. We need to go. I am not going anywhere without getting that reward. Morty, we need to go now. I think their peril finally hits home for Morty at this yeah. point. She says she needs to get medical stuff from Charlie's car, but when she leaves, she doesn't take the car keys with her. No, and I worried Charlie knows this is obviously BS. Mm. Meanwhile, Trey is angry and panicking in one of the rooms and can't believe that the cops will be getting called for a measly $75,000 reward. The working class hero Jimmy points out that for most folk that's quite a lot of money. And mocks him by suggesting that he just opens his wallet and pays them off like he usually does. Yeah, he says you should offer them double. Hmm. This angers Trey, who reminds him that he took the money 10 years earlier. And Jimmy is forced to sort of step back and step down a bit and accept this fact. And he tries to de-escalate a little bit here, but Trey points out the girls are shady and unpredictable and they maybe need to take care of them. This, I think, disturbs Jimmy. He thinks he can handle them and, if required, can slip them some blues, which will knock them out, and in the morning they can be paid off. What I like he... how Jimmy's spending Trey's money. Yeah, but he's also uh, equipped for needing to knock some girls out. Yeah, why is he carrying <laughs> these blues? I mean, I assume this is some kind of date rape drug or something. I don't. Maybe it's just like a like a tamazi pack, a sleeping pill that you would use. Yeah, to, why has he got that on him to give out? No, maybe use it yourself. People take oh, uh, sleeping. I that's possible. The way he refers to it as blues, though. Yeah, I think suggests that's maybe he's dealing them. Yeah. I mean, you know that he supplies uh, cocaine to people. Yeah, maybe. Anyway. Uh, Trey says he better be right because the last thing he needs is quotes another chick going crazy which kind of piques Jimmy's interest but before he can ask anything they're disturbed by something outside yeah they see someone wandering around with one, one of the, the two women again just like in the, the, the Shining footsteps in the snow are followed in this case by uh, Morty who is led to the spot yeah she uses the light on her phone to identify this area and takes a photo of Chloe's skeleton, and we see her skull and everything. But while she's doing this, we see Trey looming behind her and fear the worst as he reaches for his gun. Unfortunately for him, uh, he's already been pickpocketed previously, <laughs> and it is Morty who turns on him with the gun. Again, he has the arrogance to try and play things cool, but Morty is not that naive and works out what has happened and points out his stupidity in doing what he did in the snow and in very distinctive footwear. She thinks that she's caught the psychopathic asshole who hit her friend with his car and buried her in a tree. However, business is business and she's willing to do a deal uh, and is happy when he asks her what she wants. Yeah, she tells him it's the first smart thing he's said all but, night. <laughs> back at the motel, Charlie is struggling with a wheeled chair to try and get her keys which are hung high on a wall. Unable to reach them, she spots a photograph on the wall which catches her eye. Yeah, it's a group of youths and she recognises the two guys alongside Chloe Jones. So obviously she's now placed them together, they do know. Yeah. And it must be worrying because when mentioning it earlier, no one said, oh yeah, we were friends. No one, yeah, no one said anything. Yeah. Uh, Jimmy comes back in at this point and asks where Morty's gone. And knows she's lying when Charlie says that she's away to get something from her car as the keys are still there. Yeah, Charlie agrees that was a, an error. Mm -hmm. He takes a photo from her and she states that he knew Chloe Jones. Meanwhile, outside. Morty has done a, a Miss Lysanka. And <laughs> That's a niche Colombo reference there. Yeah, Miss Lysanka was someone who tried to blackmail a, a known killer. Yes, it's always a foolish choice. Yes. She has got Trey 
to give him his $300,000 Lam- uh, 300, Lamborghini. I looked this up. You can get these today for £150,000. So I think that might be a, an exaggerate, exaggeration unless in the States there's some other sort of tax involved. Is that second hand or brand new? Not brand new, I think. Mm, maybe an older model. Here's the thing as well. I had a quick glance at it. Um, some of the car review sites and what have you and YouTube and magazines give it a 3 out of 5 if I was dropping 300k in a, a vehicle I would want that to be a 5 out of 5 would you? Start. Yeah, would oh, yeah. you take the 5 out of 5 Kia over the 3 out of 5 Lamborghini? I don't know I just, I would, I'd be going for another uh, another car that's uh, in my price range but more uh, highly <laughs> Morty seems impressed by it. anyway she knows all the, the details of the car the model the rarity I suppose of it well, she, well. yeah she boasts it she's not just a a wallet thief although I'm not sure that sh- that's within her sort of spectrum of <laughs> yeah, crimes she spots the dent from um, Charlie on the side of the car yes and that the wing mirror is missing but is happy to put her humanity to the side when he hands her the keys she sits in the driver's seat and reminds him not to call the she cops she stupidly reminds him uh, because yeah she says that she's got a phone full of photos which results in the inevitable yeah, he basically slams her head into the steering wheel and kills her. Just about, yeah, good enough, as good as. At least knocks her out. Meanwhile, Charlie is sitting with Jimmy, who has put a drink in front of her and has decided to speak more freely about the past and Chloe. Trey was the one who was tight with Chloe. They had this on again, off again thing. But sometimes we all hung out. It was fun being around her. You know, she had an energy. I miss her. I'm sorry. Uh, Yeah, it seems like she was kind of a big deal with the snowboarding. Sort of a real small town hero, huh? Everyone thought she was going to go to the Olympics. Then she just vanished. People talked. Pressure got to her. Being the golden child, she skipped town. There's a lot of talk. You're not looking so hot. Yeah. Should take these. It's ibuprofen. Let's start with two. Yeah, thanks. So you think that's her out there? I don't want to think about it. Right, I mean, I... I mean, I just, I, I can't get over the coincidence, you know? Uh, like, you think that maybe the same guy... What did I just say? I can't think about it, you know? It's, it's too hard. You know, this isn't a cold case mystery for me. It's or some bullshit. It never f***ing goes away. Does it ever go away? I wish I'd had have protected her um, from whatever. I, I wish I'd have been strong like that. I would say in my top five sort of rules I go by to stay alive and, and, and not be abducted or molested in any sort of ways, never accept or take uh, pills, loose pills from, from some stranger that uh, have not been produced in a, a, a packet or a bottle. You've learned after that incident with the Viagra, haven't you? Yep, it was a very hard lesson I, I learned. The less said about that, the better. Charlie. What do you mean less? <laughs> Crack on. Charlie sympathises with Jimmy, although she's clearly weary. She's picked up on something. You know, I, I think that she realises that he's genuinely distraught and she apologises for these questions and talks of her own dark times her own recent dark times metaphorically and literally yeah she says it's hard to feel safe and you can see a tear rolling down his face and then she believes him when he claims that he will not let anything happen to her that night I'd be worried that she someone said that it's like I definitely well, would. Why, why are you thinking about? Yeah, yeah. Why? Would, why are you thinking about that? Yeah, it's like that. Okay. Okay. You're definitely not going to be murdered by me with a <laughs> yeah. knife tonight. <laughs> okay. okay. Thanks. She tells him that all she really wants to do is get off the mountain. Puts the pills in her mouth. Takes a drink. But she immediately starts to have a, a third person. 
Well, this is it. So she flashes back again to the same thing that she flashed back and, to before. And I'm sure, yeah. And we find out it's because the coconut rum smells like the coconut suntan lotion that ah, her dad, I think her dad was yeah. using. Well, this is it's a very hairy man, which we assume is the father rubbing yeah. sunscreen into his very hairy shoulders. And we see it saying coconut on the bottle. And then th this uh, vision, this dream transforms into him holding her like the hunk beside the, the campfire. So there's some real daddy issues here. Yeah, something's going on. Something is going on. Anyway, she asked Jimmy what is in the cup that she drank from. Yeah, and he tells her it's Trey's coconut rum after, after smelling it. Yeah, and goes to get something else. And as he does, she falls onto the floor, slurring the words strong ibuprofen. Uh, she, this seems un, uh, odd to us as viewers because surely she knew he was lying when he said it was ibuprofen. Yeah, but we don't know what was in the drink. Yeah, that's true. So anyway, we go back out to Trey and Morty, or what used to be Morty. Yeah, he is loading her into the driver's seat of the Lambo, erasing all her phone contacts. How does he do that without a password? Don't know, and also that would be really suspicious. Yeah, with a completely blank phone. Yeah. Yeah, I, I crashed my car myself after erasing my phone. It's like the old uh, sort of trope you get in these type of shows where if you... A bit like in the stall where there was no... He cleaned the bottle of from alcohol, the poison. Yes, it's the same thing. It's and too it, clean. Too yeah. clean. Or sometimes you'd find a gun with no fingerprints on it, which meant yeah. that it wasn't a suicide that had been wiped. That type of thing. So that was a clue in Stitching Crime mm. when they found the drugs under the sink but with no fingerprints. Precisely. Anyhow, yes, he, he pushes the car off the That cuff. was like a, a Dr. Wesley Corman in Uneasy Lies the Crown, if you remember. Okay. Put the car in, put the, 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 in the neutral and over the cliff. Yep. Back at the motel, Trey returns and we see Jimmy move the wheelchair further away from Charlie before heading over. And at this point, Jimmy sees Trey coming back alone and goes out to speak to him. And as soon as he does, Charlie sits up and spits out the, the fake ibuprofen. Yes, she puts them in the mug that she drank from. And outside we see Trey telling Jimmy, and Charlie can hear this through I've, the walls. Okay, I've got a question about this. Okay. So the she wasn't spiked. So what was that hallucination? Well, I mean, she's been in a lot of pain. Mm. Straight after it, when she's pretending to be... Well, she does put them in her mouth, so maybe this is uh, a bit of an effect. Uh, or maybe, it's just, maybe it's just to bluff the viewer. I, that che that's cheating. You can't bluff the viewer like that. Well, you put it in writing. I have. I'll put it in, put it in audio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so like I say, Charlie can hear through the walls as Trey tells Jimmy that he fixed their problems and Morty's not going to be a problem anymore, and Charlie realises what that means. Yeah, obviously it distresses her. She also calls BS as she hears Trey claim that he only did it because uh, Morty was trying to steal his car and was going to go with the cops. He says nobody will miss her. Mm. And we see Charlie crawling across the floor trying to get near to where the keys are. Trey and Jimmy are now shouting at each other, trying to blame each other for, for what's happened. And again, Trey mentions another chick going crazy on him. He says he doesn't want to trash his $300,000 car because some chick is going crazy on him again. And Jimmy looks really upset. Well, this time he picks him up on it and asks if he meant Chloe when yes. he said another. Yes. He starts to deny it, but at this point they hear noises from inside as Charlie manages to drop the contents of the key holder rack on top of her. Yes, Trey is in there quick enough to get the car keys before she can escape with them. Although how she was going to get past them, I'm not sure. And drive a car with a, a broken oh, leg. She could use her left if it's an automatic. Mm, yeah, sure. In desperation, Charlie knows that her best chance of survival is to turn Jimmy against Trey. And so she starts making accusations that Jimmy was uh, already starting to believe. Obviously, we saw right from the start that he's not happy, he's got his doubts, he doesn't particularly yeah. like. So we should say what Jimmy believes is what Trey told him, that Chloe died after... No, we get to that later, yeah. Is, are we still coming to that? Yeah, I've not come to that yet. Oh, we're about to come to it right Okay, now. are we? <laughs> okay, so Trey thinks Charlie knows too much and mm -hmm. needs to be dealt with, and but Jimmy's going back to the question from outside. What did he mean by another chick going crazy? Yes. And yeah, at this point, what do we what do we think, or what do we find out that Jimmy thinks happened? So Jimmy thinks that Chloe died after an accident due to bad coke that he had sold them. So he feels somewhat responsible as well. well Trey has persuaded him to yes. feel responsible, and so he's helped him hide the body. But Charlie cries BS on this, and also when he claims not to have hit or pushed her. Yeah, well, I mean, do they know that she can tell? They don't no. know that she can tell. I so she he, she should just be yelling this. Yeah, but anyway. Uh, Trey tells Jimmy he's always been his protector and now he can return the favour. He also says uh, uh, he also says another sort of callous thing. He says, 
they were just kids. Who cares what happened to Chloe? Well, that's going to upset Jimmy, isn't it? Because we know that he had a thing for her. Mm. Obviously, this doesn't go down well with the more emotionally normal Jimmy. And so Trey resorts to offering him whatever he wants in order to get out of this situation as long as they do this one last thing, i.e. kill Charlie. It looks like he's agreed at this point. He picks up a knife. Yes, and the relieved Trey uh, tells him to get her outside. It's going to be cleaner out there. But instead, what does he do? He stands between uh, Trey and Charlie and tells Trey that he's ruined his life. And so the psycho turns on him. He tears into him always being a loser and uh, how he's going to remain one for the rest of his life. Jimmy says that he's done being Trey's bitch, but we don't get much reaction to that. No, because... um, Trey shoots him straight through the head. He's also taken the gun back from Morty. Mm. He then turns it on our screaming hero, but the punk could not remember if he had fired six or seven shots. <laughs> yeah, there's no bullets left. That's fortuitous. Now, here's the thing. I, I might have mentioned this before. As you know, I definitely have mentioned this before. I used to watch uh, get a gun channels on YouTube, <laughs> even, though I'm, <laughs> even though I'm anti-gun. But what I learned from that as well, in addition to gun safety... I also learned that the, 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 the two the two sounds that you don't want to hear when you pull uh, a trigger. So you don't want to hear a click when you expect a bang and you don't want to hear a bang when you expect a click. <laughs> no, obviously. At this point, Trey goes for his backup option. Yeah, he leaps for the knife in Jimmy's hand, but Charlie gets there first and uh, he cuts his leg just like in the... I was going to say, got, you know, just like the night shift. Yeah. They struggle on the floor only for him to get on top of her and dramatically do what? He kills her. But seem to be. I mean, he plunges the knife, a, 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 a large knife, directly... Like, it's like a hunting knife. Yeah, right into her chest. I mean, you'd have to be a really crap at killing not to kill someone in that situation. Yeah. And then not to even notice if they're not dead. No. If I was doing it, I would stab them a few times and maybe slit their throat. You've not thought about this at all, though? Never, never. Happily married man. <laughs> no, it's just exactly the same, isn't it? If, when, when it's um the good the, the good guy or the good girl if you like the serial killer and you think you know finish them off because always get back up yeah it's, it's in principle we probably shouldn't joke about violence against women but not joking about it i'm saying if i was a killer <laughs> you're saying you would oh, okay. i thought okay no if i was, a, no, if I was <laughs> a killer i would uh, not if a woman of anyone no, i would okay. make sure uh, but, but that's fair, right i'm confident if i was in his situation on top of someone be dead with a knife she would be dead at the end yeah i would not be leaving myself open to to, to, to that yeah and you have the photos to prove it <laughs> Outside, Trey dumps the bodies in the spot. He then returns briefly to the motel where he throws a bloody rag into the fire and takes a drink from his mug without leaving prints. Now, we then get a close-up of the dissolved pills in the mug, which I thought was maybe a bit unnecessary. We know she put the pills in there. Leave it to viewer I know, to remember. I, I think I, I wasn't quite sure of that in a, okay. uh, until I, I clicked, yeah. Fair enough. Well, that means they were right to show it. Then, they were, yeah. obviously. For idiots like <laughs> For me. For idiots like you. Uh, yes, uh, he then leaves in Charlie's car. Gets back. Uh, well, yeah, I think he dumps the car somewhere. Yeah, went in the woods somewhere. And then starts to uh, head on foot back to his house. And as he does so, we see he starts to hallucinate himself a little bit. He makes eye contact with a stag, which walks away. What is a stag? What's the symbolism here? Just the stag's just disappointed in him I think right okay it's probably the same one that he didn't uh, kill uh, earlier that's it yeah it's three times now yeah it must mean something okay I'm too stupid to work it <laughs> that's a, maybe it's a reference to something else okay anyhow we'll get lots of tweets if, if you've missed an obvious reference <laughs> again <laughs> so, do you not remember that movie with the stag <laughs> anyway we see the garage door open at two minutes to seven and he's very pumped that he apparently, as far as he's concerned, he's got away with this. Totally guilt free. Yeah, that's how you do it. <laughs> he's a moron, <laughs> isn't he? At this point, his parole officer rings the doorbell and he answers before going to clean his leg up. Okay, this didn't sit right with me. He just get in there, and then two seconds later, the the, the, the the intercom. He must have seen him. The cop must have been in the vicinity. Well, he came in through the garage, so I don't know if it's... Really? I don't know. And then there's footprints all over the... You would the, think they, they would follow mm. the footprints in the street, but then maybe not looked for them yet at this point. Okay. Anyhow, his elation is short-lived because as he's toweling off his cut leg, what does he notice? He realises that Charlie's last act was to take his ankle monitor away. Oh, and we have a, a brief shot at the spot where we see the device beeping in her hand as she lies next to Morty. And then 
we get a shock. Yeah, she takes a shallow breath and miraculously seems like she might be alive. This would have been a good point to end the episode. Knowing that you've got one more, I, I might have I might have been I don't I mean they must have been tempted to end it here. Put that in writing. Tell me you got this bit wrong. No, I'm not saying that one way's definitely better, but I'm saying this must, be a, is. this must have been a consideration. Okay. That you just roll credits at this point. Sure. Anyway. We don't, because we rejoin Charlie in the hospital in a neck brace, hooked up to machines, and sarcastically mutters as she wakes, Merry Christmas to herself. Her leg is in a brace and she makes a Robocop reference. Yes. Have ever. you seen Robocop? I've seen Robocop in the late 80s though. Okay. <laughs> she then sees on the television that Chloe's body has been discovered. Alongside Jimmy. And also, there was someone called Charlie Kale found in a Lamborghini. So, Morty's Morty stolen the wallet again, yeah. Yeah. Now, the, the whole thing was based on a, a tip-off to a parole officer, obviously. That was Charlie. And we find out that Trey Nelson is the prime suspect. And at this point, Charlie Wait, looks did you down... Say Trey Nelson? Yeah. Because in... The IMDb credits, he's called Trey Mendes. Ah. Uh -huh. Unless you've misheard. I might have misheard. Okay. But I might not have because, as you mentioned, IMDb... Did you mention on... I didn't mention... I mentioned before we started recording. IMDb's got a lot of mistakes in relation to this. There's things missing and names yeah. wrong and stuff like uh -huh, that. Yeah. Someone needs to go around and tidy it up. Mm. Just saying. Anyway, she looks down and sees that she's been tagged as a Jane Doe and therefore thinks all her Christmases here have came at once. She's delighted. Yeah, because... I'm dead, she says. Cliff and Sterling will assume she's been dead and she's no longer being hunted. But this leads me back to what I said at the start of the podcast. What is the backstory? Even if you aren't in great speaking terms with your parents or your siblings or your any extended family or even friends... Yeah you still probably wouldn't want them thinking you were dead. Well, she's not had time to really process that yet, has she? She just thinks she's got out of a problem. Yeah, I suppose she can then make contact with or she could, or, or, Yeah, or may or may not, it's really up to her, but mm -hmm. she maybe just hasn't gotten through that process of going through all the possible repercussions of being dead. Yeah, sure. She just thinks it's solved a problem. Fair enough. However, we then get one final shot. We've got Cliff outside in the car on the phone to Sterling saying it's over. We've got her. All I need to know is how deep to dig the hole. So how would he have found this out? Well, find out next week. Will we? Okay. I think we will. But yeah, it's building to the final episode very nicely, I think. It is crescendoing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I've got a few things. So do you think this could have been, this story just with a bit of extra, maybe some flashbacks for Chloe and some back story for Morty could easily have been a feature-length film. Oh, yeah. I thought it had that sort of feel about it as well. Sure. Yeah. Which murders do you think there's enough evidence to convict Treya? Uh, Jimmy yeah Jimmy I don't know Morty's in his car you maybe get that one yeah but she's a car thief yeah they might get away with that mm -hmm. what about Jimmy Jimmy was shot so someone has shot him with his own gun mm. we don't know where the gun is we don't know if Trey took the gun no but when they find the Chloe's body and that ties them all together but is there any evidence that you killed Chloe no. Well, no. Circumstantial. He knows where the body is. Yeah. Is that evidence of murder? You can connect him to Chloe. You can connect him to Jimmy. But can you prove that he killed any of them? No, probably not. Is there even much of a case? You, his ankle monitor is there, so that places him at the location. Yeah. Or at least, well, unless he argues. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no, the ankle monitor, I think, does. It's yeah. still quite circumstantial, though, isn't it? There's not any direct mm, ah, but not well, Charlie maybe can give evidence against him how, did that, how, does, how does the ankle monitor get there when Charlie cut his leg she's cut through the monitor yeah so he was there so he was definitely there yeah but she's not going to give any evidence okay. <laughs> now, I think you could probably build a, a case a that possible would, case yeah I'd say so it's yeah. how good his lawyer is and he's very rich mm, yes yeah I suspect we might find him back on house arrest okay <laughs> uh, other thing how, how is Charlie alive well, that's what I said. Knocked it's, down, that car should have killed her. Mm -hmm. um, buried alive, that could possibly have killed her. Uh, stabbed. There's just just being in the cold when you're... Yeah, exposure. So yeah, And that's severe, you know, you're, you're ready, or your system's depleted, you're losing blood. She could easily be bleeding internally. Yeah. I think we have to put this down to, again, the, the tick slightly... Into, armor. In, in, into the, the uh, in, into unreality it's or... close to supernatural. And, and then the gun not firing as well. Mm-hmm. That's just charmed luck. life. Yes, yeah, certainly charmed. Okay. 
I've got a couple of little trivia things. Okay. This was the first episode they shot, which is quite remarkable when you consider really? the fact that the character of Charlie feels like it's been building. Now, what I would suggest, because it's only the 10 episodes, I reckon this, unlike more sort of mainstream traditional shows, I reckon this has been plotted out from start to finish. It's not, they've not done it on the hoof. It's not been ad hoc. So they've known exactly how it's yeah, going to end. They'll have all the scripts, I would imagine. Yeah. But they didn't film anything before. Sure. Yes. Uh, and the other one is uh, Stephanie Sue, who you're going to tell us went to the um, played mm -hmm. Morty. She went to the same high school and lived in the same small town as the showrunners Nora and Leila Zuckerman. Oh, there you go. Who you're also going to tell us about, I think. I am. Uh, and finally, episode title for me. You think it's uh, Escape to Witch Mountain? I, I of course have. it is. You don't think it's Escape from New York? Nope. I've Escape from New York's. No, Ian, you're wrong. Got, uh, a Columbo connection. Uh, it's quite handy. Not as many as Escape to okay, we'll Witch go, We'll go through one and I'll leave it to you. Okay, we'll start firstly with uh, the production information. The 2nd of March 2023 was the original air date. And we've got a, a biggie this week. We've got Ryan Johnson, creator, writer, Who's director, that? everything. Well, he's, he's the man behind the show, okay. isn't he? Man behind lots of things. He was born on the 17th of December 1973. He is known for, where did we start? Knives Out, Glass Onion, Looper, Brick, Star Wars Episode 8, Breaking Bad, The Brothers Bloom. My favourite, um, Evil Demon Golf Ball from Hell, which I think starred Lucky McKee. Okay. And two The Mountain Goats videos, which uh, the, the singer is John Dunn. Uh, yes, he was in yeah. the episode Rest of Metal, yeah. Yeah. He attended uh, San Clemente High School, or Clement, I don't know, with an E, Clemente, Clement, where Brick was primarily filmed. Okay. He is, as we mentioned before, married to Karina Longworth uh, of the You Must Remember This podcast. His cousin is composer Nathan Johnson, who's a composer on uh, this show and many others. And his brother is uh, uh, Aaron, or Aaron Johnson, who's, a, who's involved in the business also. He was apparently inspired to become a, a movie maker, a filmmaker, by watching Annie Hall, the, the Woody Allen classic. And you know me, a big Woody Allen fan, despite what some people might You've said this many wrongly times. say I have, yeah. He founded T Street Productions alongside Ram Bergman. T Street is one of the, the joint producers of yeah. Poker Face. He's also a folk singer and a banjo player, which reminded me of... Steve Martin, who's a well-known banjoist. He's obviously got banjo music features quite heavily in this. Sure. Uh, but the Steve Martin connection, he also is in a a, a murder mystery uh, moment, TV yeah. show, uh, uh, which is set uh, around a podcast yeah. as well. So all sorts of connections there. He has been Oscar nominated twice for Knives Out and Glass Onion. And in 2023, this year, Time Magazine named him one of the hundred most influential people in the world, which is nice. That's a, a high place to be. Where would you, if I had to say, where would you place yourself in the world for infl uh, for influence? I'm not in the top hundred. Oh, now it's honourable mention. You know. A gatekeeper, caretaker. You might say. <laughs> okay. Interestingly, about the Oscar nominations, um, I remember reading about this. Glass Onion was nominated for best adapted screenplay, even oh. though it's an original story, because all sequels have to go under adapted screenplay in the Oscars yeah, yeah. rules. Nice trivia there. The writers this week, pair of siblings, Nora and Leela Zuckerman. I've heard of them. Yeah, because you'll see them every week on the screen. I mentioned them a minute ago, yeah. yeah. They're writers and producers. I'm not a lot of information, but the, they're a team, so they work in... They're the showrunners for this. Yeah. Uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., Prodigal Son, Haven, and Suits, other, I suppose, most high-profile endeavours, indeed. The cast. Let's go. Joseph Gordon Levitt obviously played Trey. He was born on the 17th of February 1981. He, he's got one of those weird CVs where I think to myself, oh, he's just Gordon Levitt. That's the wee guy from Third Drop from the Sun. And I don't necessarily jump to any other one until you look at his CV and you go, yeah, he's been in everything. So we've got uh, Brick, as we mentioned, Looper, Inception, Knives Out, Glass Onion, Snowden, Lincoln, The Dark Knight Rises, 500 Days of Summer, Family Ties, and he was also in one episode of Quantum Leap. Well. Which we've not covered yet. We will cover it in the yeah. coming months. If you do like Quantum Leap, uh, and you want to listen to a podcast about that, where can people... Uh, TheLeapHome.com. We've got that going up 
the end of season three. Yeah. That's the second. I mentioned right back in episode one of the Poker Face podcast that there were two acting connections and we've covered Kay Callan and this is the second one. Nice one. His brother Dan Gordon Levitt was a producer and photographer who sadly passed away in 2010. I think he was only in his mid 30s. One of his favourite actors is or was Gina Rollins, a Columbo alumni. There you go. If you remember, she played the uh, the woman in the wheelchair in playback with Oscar Verma. Yes, and she was married to uh, John Casavetes from Richard and Black on and Long Term uh, Peter Falk. Kind of friend and, and, yes. Yeah. And bit of an all round genius. J.G. L., as I sometimes uh, call him, was born on exactly the same day as Paris Hilton. I told Hilton. you to stop that. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no. Uh, born on the same day as Paris Hilton. And interestingly, here for me, so I, I don't know if it was this podcast or if it was back in Quantum Leap, but I mentioned that my son, he's, he's 10, so I'm, I'm taking him through 80s and sort of 90s action and movies. So he's, oh, he's watched them all the, all the big ones. Yeah. Rocky's his favourite. He's watched every Rocky now, all, all the way through to Creed Three. I thought Rocky the first one might be a little bit too much for him because it's more of a drama than a yeah, yeah. than what people remember. Uh, but no, absolutely loves it. Anyway, recently we've just completed watching Beverly Hills Cop one, two, and three. Never seen them. Very good. Oh, come on, I've seen the first one. I mean, I've seen them all. But I was much younger. But just I didn't realise that this was happening. It's in post production. They're making Beverly Hills Cop four. All the gang are back, and Joseph Gordon Levitt will be. In it as well. There you go. And just on that, actually, we've now we're now watching Fletch two. We watched Fletch one the other night there, and uh, obviously the connection there is Harold uh, Faltermeyer, the, who, the the great composer. You know, Axel F, the theme tune for Beverly Hills Cop and Fletch. Okay, brilliant. Didn't even know there was a Fletch two. Fletch lives. Okay. And there's also the one with John Hamm recently, the a reboot based on uh, one of the books. It's it's based on a series of books by Gregory McDonald. Anyway, where were we? Sidetracked there. Sidetracked there. But yeah, Beverly Hills Cop four. Jimmy was played by David Castaneda. He was born in LA on October 24th, 1989, but he was raised in Mexico until he was 14. You probably have seen him in, in The Umbrella Certainly Academy. Have. He's also been in Switched at Birth, Jane the Virgin, and Most Dangerous Game, which I'm not sure if that was the Columbo one. I don't think he was in the Columbo no. one. That was before 1989, wasn't it? I, I've, I've, to this day, Most Dangerous Game, Most Crucial Match. It's can, the chess one. I can never remember what's what. I always get confused with those. It's the Most Dangerous Match, isn't is it? it? Yeah, well, yeah, so it's not quite the same. I call it the chess one and the American football one. Yeah. But neither of them have anything to do with this guy. No, not at all. <laughs> He's very good in the Umbrella Academy. People is should he? watch that. Okay. Stephanie Hugh, who you mentioned, played Morty. She was born in 1990 on the 25th of November. Recently, she has appeared in The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. That's quite popular. I, I fancy it, but I've not ever got around to watching not it. seen it myself. The Path, Girl Code, Karate Tortoise. And this, again, I found... I, I was buzzing when I, when I heard this. Didn't know what was happening. She is in... The new movie they're making uh, about the Fall Guy, the Fall Guy movie. Oh, I, okay. What Ryan Gosling is playing Coke Seavers, and I want to know who's playing um, Heather Thomas. Do you? Yes. Anyone of uh, my vintage, or anyone who's watched uh, the Fall Guy back in the day, remembers the opening credits as well from I think season two or season three on when she goes through those saloon doors in that bikini. Oh, Heather! Yes, Heather Thomas and Heather Lockley are very you know T.G. Hooker. You, people get them mixed up all the time. Right. But anyhow. Well, I'll tell you something amusing. There you go. I find it amusing. So, uh, Howie was another catty sidekick and it played, I think, with D Douglas Barr, I think. But I remember, I went through a little period when I first, when IMDB and internet sort of became a thing 20 years ago. You could find out information about people or you would look up old shows that, that you know, previously, how would you know what they were doing with themselves? So I went through this little period of finding out what uh, old actors from TV shows, quite obscure sometimes, and then emailing them Right. At their new place of work, <laughs> so that's not at all odd. No, we had uh, so Douglas Barr at one point had a a, a, a vineyard somewhere in uh, California, and I found out you know the, the the company, and I emailed them saying, "Oh, I'm a massive fan. Can I have an autograph?" And he never <laughs> get back to me. Uh, no one get back to me. I also um, Chunk from the Goonies. I reckon he probably had a spam filter on any email that comes in. See the one that's a lawyer. Yes, he's yeah. an attorney. And also Paul from the Wonder Years. He became a lawyer as well. The urban myth was that he was actually Marilyn Manson, which is not true. But I, I found where he worked and I harassed him. When I say harassed, I sent one email. These are still open inquiries with the police, aren't they? Yeah, yeah. No one ever got back to me. Probably the most obscure one, it's got a, a slight connection here, was uh, the dark-haired mother from Kate and Ali. 
Did you ever watch Kate and Ali sitcom? No. Okay. Used to fancy the mother and the daughter. At the same time? Yes. Uh, Jane Curtin, she was also the one of the co-stars who appeared in Third Drop from the Sun. So I'm bringing it all back here. Anyway, the, the dark-haired mother from Kate and Ali, I found that she had a, a shop somewhere in whatever, New York. I emailed her and I think, yeah, I get a FBI warning or something like that. <laughs> no doubt. That's me running a little rant there. Look, the hunk. Hey, hold on, you remember oh. from Stephanie too without mentioning everything everywhere all at once? The massive Oscar winning movie that she was one of the main stars of. I was just about to say that. Okay. <laughs> You've said it now, so that's Fair fine. Enough, let's move on. <laughs> Look, the hunk was played by Chris uh, Cortez. He's mainly, I think, a, he's done a bit of acting, but a stuntman. Yeah. Uh, so he's been in Quantum Leap, the, the reboot, The Cleaning Lady, Black Panther, NCIS, and also Picard. Escape from Ship Mountain, as you wrongly claimed, is in fact a reference to Escape to which Mountain, which is Kurt Russell, isn't it? Uh, which is three big Colombo connections. Just to get the president out. We have the main star Eddie Albert, who was in Deadweight, alongside Ray Milland, Death Lends a Hand, and The Greenhouse Jungle, and finally Donald Pleasance. He was in Escape to New York from New York, <laughs> but also. Um, any old port in a storm if and, you want to Columbo and I'll just give you a quick Star Wars one as well uh, Lawrence Mon Montaigne he played uh, Star Trek S Star Trek yeah what did I say Star Wars yeah same thing <laughs> Ryan Johnson <laughs> yeah exactly uh, Star Trek yeah he played Stone and somebody else I think uh, he was with the, one of the Romulans I think in the episode where the two captains yeah. decided not to fight each other if you like Star Trek there's a podcast called Fascinating. Uh, we covered the, or the original series in its entirety, along with the movies that followed. Give it a listen, yeah. Okay, we'll quickly wrap up. This is a long one. So the motto of this week, cover up. Yeah, self-preservation. The clues, uh, the leg tag itself being you know seen, the, the, the picture of them all together and Trey lying about how he didn't murder anyone. It was all an accident. Lying about not having the wanted poster, the footprints in the snow... And the probability of Charlie being put into the same spot as another uh, victim. Okay. Anything else? Well, no, I don't suppose so. Okay. The gotcha would have been obviously the, the bodies being found with the, the, with the tag. The tag yeah. yeah. The tip off as well as a bit of a. Yeah, how did that work? Charlie's phoned the police or whatever. Charlie doesn't have a phone. Oh, no, she must have I done should have just tracked down the tag. No, it said it was a tip off. From the tag guy, though. He must have said, no. we've got the tag beeping in this location. That's not a tip-off then. That's the police finding it. Yeah, that's why I found it a bit odd. No, I think Charlie's tipped him off. Mm, okay. In terms of who did crimes this week, uh -huh. you've got Trey, who killed Chloe, Morty and Jimmy and tried to kill Charlie. Yeah. Um, Jimmy, who helped to hide Chloe's body. And Morty, who stole a bunch of stuff. Yeah. Jimmy and Morty are dead and will therefore not be prosecuted. And we've talked already about whether Trey's going to get away with any of that. Product placement... I think we saw Trey using one of those, was Oculus there? Yeah, when he was doing these gaming, yep. The delivery driver had a Honda, there was Johnny Walker Black Label, and the uh, Lamborghini, obviously. Was his exercise I thing that, a Peloton? I, I don't know. It okay. could have been, but I don't, we didn't see it, and it, wasn't, it was never referenced, okay. so. It, other brands do exist, apparently. That's what they say. Hmm. Peloton might not last much longer, I think they took a massive hit post- Lockdown. I will sound way out of date if they've gone bust by the time we publish this. Mm -hmm. What have we got next week? Next week's episode is the series finale or the season finale. It's called The Hook, which is obviously another reference. Indeed, we might do a little wrap up after that as well. We might do. Anyway, we'll find Charlie facing up to the problems that have been following her all season long. Until then, cheerio. Bye bye.